Well, welcome everyone to our Emerging Leaders Speaker Series uh, Fireside Chat conversation tonight. Uh, Emerging Leaders is content specific, uh, most relevant for those within the 25 to 40-ish age bracket. Uh, with content relevant uh, in two different areas. Number one, for young entrepreneurs, and then number two, for those looking to rise in their corporate careers. If you're unfamiliar with Business Navigators, it's been around in one iteration or the other over the last several years, but it's a, a learning organization based here in Dallas, centered on the tenant of servant leadership. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and get started with tonight's program. So uh, we've got Julian Placino and our friend Rich Russo, um, member of Business Navigators, friend of Business Navigators. Um, how this is gonna roll, guys, is uh, we're gonna have a nice fireside chat style conversation about, um, this will be focusing on corporate career tracks. So, um, high, how to get hired in 30 days or less, actionable steps you could, one can take, and then also uh, what recruiters think of you when they look at your LinkedIn profile. So we'll have a good conversation surrounding this, and uh, both of them will have some specific um, short presentations surrounding their two topics. Rich Russo is Vice President of Global Search Operations and Professional Search for Corn Ferry, a global organizational consulting firm. Prior to joining Corn Ferry, Mr. Russo was a principal consultant developing knowledge and information management strategies to support oil and gas global 100 clients. He's traveled extensively on five continents in his work to improve the use of critical business information for decision making, leveraging SharePoint and FileNet. Mr. Russo also served as a manager at Accenture, where he was the program office and integration architect for the merger of the two oil and gas companies. At the time, this merger created the largest public company to use the SAP platform. In the early part of his career, Mr. Russo deployed as an infantry captain in the U.S. Army during Operation Uphold Democracy and Operation Pacific Haven. Rich holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Julian Placino is a recruiting professional with 11 years of experience in agency and corporate staffing. He's been instrumental in advancing the careers of hundreds of technology, creative, and sales professionals across the country. For seven years, Julian led talent acquisition for Bottle Rocket, one of the premier mobile development firms in the world. Julian is the host of the Pathways to Success podcast, where he conducts in-depth interviews with world-class performers to, to, to discover their mindsets, tactics, and behaviors. He's interviewed company founders, CEOs, New York Times best-selling authors, TEDx speakers, celebrity athletes, and prolific entrepreneurs. Having a passion for helping the staffing industry evolve, Julian founded the Pathways to Success training company, which helps staffing companies gain new clients and recruit better candidates through professional development and leadership training. Possessing a dynamic presentation style, Julian was signed to the theatrical and broadcast division of Kim Dawson, one of the most prestigious talent agencies in the country. He's done acting, modeling, and voiceover work for AT&T, Ford, NFL, American Heart Association, DCCCD, Edward Jones, Hilti, and more. Please welcome Rich Russo and Julian Placino. I'm gonna give you some tips on LinkedIn because I wanna expose some of the things that we see every day uh, and give you a little bit of insight into the mind of a recruiter to make yourself uh, a little bit more visible of what you do. So, let's think about a regular company. Doesn't matter what size, when they have a role to fill, here's what typically goes through their mind. First thing is, who on the team do we know? Could we promote? Um, who's, who's in our, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not a young executive, maybe you think back to who's in your Rolodex, right? <laughs> Versus who's in your contact list, your LinkedIn profile, right? Now, if you have trouble hiring that way, usually you go to HR. And HR looks at who's in their pipeline. Uh, they might do a search on LinkedIn, they might put out some targeted calls, or they outsource it to a vendor. Now here's the interesting thing about job searches. Most jobs don't get outside of these boxes. Okay? Most jobs are filled that way. Recruiters like myself come in afterwards when job when this stuff has failed and a job post or advertisement has failed, and that's when they go outside to a contingency recruiter or to a retained search firm like Corn Ferry. Okay. And that represents a very tiny about, a bit of the market. So that, you know, lesson number one, if you are hoping that a recruiter will call you, just realize they are not seeing all the jobs out of the market. Networking is probably the best way to find a job. 
Uh, you can see here when we ask uh, companies what are their top sources of candidates, job boards, LinkedIn is their number two, and then on down. So LinkedIn is a very good place to be, be seen. Recruiters are always looking to make a match. And when we look at your LinkedIn profile, we're trying to make a judgment call. Should I keep reading or should I move on? Because we're trying to help a client fill a specific need. At Corn Ferry, we have tools that scan over a billion resumes. Um, recruiters, once our tools pull back the names, will probably look at about 50 profiles. We've got some artificial intelligence and some things behind this that, that helps us look at the right ones. But only about 10 to 20 of those folks will receive calls. And we often make that determination of whether or not we're going to keep reading in about 10 seconds. So think about LinkedIn. We're going to focus on that today. Remember, LinkedIn's not just for recruiters or just when you're looking for a new role. Uh, being head of operations, I get a lot of vendors that check me out on LinkedIn before they give me a call. Um, I also, of course, my colleagues, supervisors, other folks in the firm may be looking at your LinkedIn profile to learn a little bit about you as well. So it's not just a marketing tool for job search. It helps you connect with the people that want uh, to understand a little bit about you before, before they engage. You always want to find legitimate reasons to re refresh your profile. Uh, that's really helpful, and it will uh, also give people some insight into what's top of mind for you. <coughs> Professional pictures, this one's hilarious. So, if you have a nice photo like this, uh, something that they airbrush the gray out of, like my picture there, <laughs> that's great. Now, a photo like this, this is a colleague of mine who's a colonel and wants to stay in the defense industry. Him wearing a military uniform is probably fine. Or if you're Bill Gates, you could wear a hat like that, right? Because he's, he's, he's okay. For the rest of us, though, I would go for the, the much more formal look, never this casual look. These are pictures of people from link, actual LinkedIn profiles. Some of these folks are vice presidents. But a little bit too casual a picture, a little bit too much information. Uh, folks always ask, what's the right amount of information on my LinkedIn profile? Should I put my whole resume out there? Right? That's kind of a rookie mistake. Don't put your whole resume out but just give folks enough information about what you do. And if you want to catch the eye of a recruiter, right, you want, to, you want to be clear about what it is you can do, what areas you're focused on. Now, years ago, I used to build Lotus Notes databases when I first came out of college. I don't want to do that anymore. So you will not find that stuff on my LinkedIn profile, right? Leave that stuff aside. Uh, for career history, just your current company and job title and one to two sentences about what the company does. Unless you work for a company that people really know, that one line about what your company does is really helpful. And then a short description of your role. I'm a vice president of operations, but I'm at a recruiting firm. Okay? So that does not compare with vice president of operations at a manufacturing firm. So what I've got to do is give people a little bit of information to help them understand the scope of my role. Be sure to cover any gaps you have uh, in your profile, because recruiters are looking from the bottom up. Where did you start? Have you moved through the right roles? If there's a gap where you took two years to get an MBA, that's perfectly understandable. I put that on there. Uh, make sure you note the degree that you earned and the date. Recruiters will often hear from a client, I must have somebody with an MBA. If you simply list that you went to Harvard, but you do not list an end date, we're going to assume you didn't graduate. And you're just like that, they're on to the next profile. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I've heard don't put the dates because it makes it easy to age discriminate. It's a valid concern. But here's the thing. I'm 47 years old. I don't want somebody coming after me and offering me an entry-level role. The fact that I know, they know I graduated in 1993 sort of gives them a hint of where I am in my career. And it helps me avoid getting calls from recruiters that aren't necessarily going to be offering me an opportunity that would be compelling at this point in my career. So I would say, don't worry about the dates. Put the dates on so we don't graduate. Put the degree, if you're in the degree, uh, the dates won't hurt you. Uh, we do look at who you're connected to. 
But recruiters don't want to troll through everyone. What they're looking for is, are you connected to the right kind of people in that industry? Recruiters spend a lot of time and we recruit in very focused areas. So if I am recruiting, uh, I used to work in the oil and gas industry, did a lot of private equity work, right? It was very helpful for me to see if a candidate was connected to the kinds of candidates that I was already working with, right? It would not be helpful to know that they were connected to grandma or everybody they went to high school with, okay? So that can give you a little, gives recruiters a little bit more information on the circles that you run around in. Uh, the, the Russo grandma or Supreme Court test is, is this. Never invite anyone on LinkedIn to connect with you that you wouldn't want your grandmother to know about. And if your grandmother's not around, think about the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> Would you feel comfortable standing up in front of the Supreme Court and say, I'm connected to this person and I stand behind them? So that's, you want to make sure your, your uh, connections pass that test. Nothing is more frustrating to a recruiter than to find a great profile and think this person has done the right things. This opportunity I've got is the right next step in their career. I can't wait to contact them. And then we look at the LinkedIn contact info and it's blank. So put your contact info out there. Some folks are worried about spam. If you want to set up a separate email address that you use just for the things that come through LinkedIn, that's certainly fine. Just remember to check that. But always put your contact info. Now, I'm sure when I put my contact info out there that I've received a few calls from a vendor or a telemarketer. Uh, and you know what? There's a tiny bit of noise that came through that channel. Uh, for the most part, though, putting this information out there has allowed the people who need to connect with me to connect with me quickly. Rather than playing that game back and forth of, email me and then do I read it? And do I respond back? Are they reading when I respond back? And it takes three weeks to make a connection. All right, let's go inside the mind of a recruiter and I'll show you two profiles. This first one, imagine I'm recruiting a role for a, a, a trainer uh, or a sales coordinator. Okay? When I look at this profile, this is interesting. This person provided the name of a company. I don't know what the ocean air is. There's thousands of companies in the world. I can't figure out all of them. Guess what? If I'm looking at this profile quickly, I'm not going to Google it. Now, I do like the fact that they gave some sales numbers and, and uh, you know, some information about themselves, but look at some of these other things here. I coordinated and planned large events. I was trying to recruit an event coordinator. I'd like to know what type of events, what size events, how many events, right? I was promoted to the top, this person was promoted to the top trainer within three months. How many people did you train? I'm going to look at this profile. If this person gave us just a little bit more info, I think they would get better calls from recruiters. <coughs> so I give this one a big X. Now, next one I'm going to show you. Imagine I'm recruiting a senior executive. This guy's a VP of operations. But take a look at the description that he gives make a pretty quick determination. This is probably someone I need to keep reading about, and then I will connect with and develop. And you can see, just with that one paragraph, it only took about 10 seconds to scan that real quick and go, that's my target candidate. This is, this is an opportunity worth giving a call. So my background in terms of recruiting is actually split with external and also internal recruiting. Do you guys know the difference between a third party and a corporate recruiter? So third-party recruiters are the organizations that companies will contract to help them find talent when they've exhausted their internal resources, right? And the internal recruiter is the company that works actually at that company that hires internally for them. I've done both. So for the past 12 years, I've got this really interesting 360 view of both sides. So there really hasn't been much I haven't seen that works and doesn't work when it comes to actually finding a job. And having helped hundreds of people find jobs, like a great privilege that I've had. I've really seen the insights of a very definitive roadmap on how you can find the, the best job that you're looking for without a referral basis. So for the last seven years of my corporate career, I've worked for a company called Bottle Rocket. Anybody heard of Bottle Rocket before? 
a lot of people here, right? So Bottle Rocket is one of the world's premier mobile development firms. We made the apps for companies like Starwood Hotels, Coca-Cola Freestyle, Chick-fil-A. And I say this because the thousand applicants apply. Any guesses of how many we hired? Five. Five. Five, okay, well, we want more than that. Less than 80, right? <laughs> so less than 80, but half of those 80 came from referrals. Why? Because people like to work with, buy from, and hire people that they know like and trust. So no matter how far technology advances, that's still gonna be the fastest way that you can get into a company and land an interview, is working your warm network. But this whole presentation is all about how do you get into a company without having any contacts, right? So this is what candidates sort of feel like whenever they apply to a job, right? Look at me, I'm a person, I have experience. Of course they're going to love me. This is quite literally what you look like right here, right? Who here has ever submitted their resume uh, and never heard anything back, like it was a black hole? Anyone? It's not a black hole, it's called an ATS, an applicant tracking system. You always end up in someone's database, right? And this is actually for a real position, an accounting clerk role I posted in 2012. And I'd like to share with you a lesson that Miss Kathy Walls taught me. So Kathy Qualls is a senior financial analyst at Bottle Rocket. She's still here today. So that role that I posted for an accounting clerk, within 24 hours, I got over 300 applicants. By the end of the week, pushing six or seven hundred, right? And for me, as a one-person recruiting shop, it was overwhelming for me to go through all of these applicants, right? So I'm kind of lazy, and I try to find like the path of least resistance when it comes to sifting through all these, these resumes, right? So I usually wait about a week. Well, the Monday after, I had someone call me up and said, hey, there's someone at the front door who wants to speak with you. And I said, interesting, who is this, right? Well, it was none other than Kathy Qualls. And for me, that was kind of like this invasive thing, right? <laughs> but we started talking, and I learned that Kathy was the former controller at UT Southwestern. So she caught my ear, started to tell me a little bit more about her background, and I was like, wow, the force is strong with this one. <laughs> so after 30 minutes of interviewing her, I put her right in front of Gary Goldman, who is her CFO. He saw the same things that I saw, and we hired her that day. Now, we hired her that day, and I didn't look through any of those 400 applicants. Is that cheating? It's the way it works. I say that because you have to be very different in terms of your approach. Yes, you as a candidate, but the how you get in front of people has to be different as well. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So when you look at a job search process, the highest value event that can take place is some kind of interaction with someone who makes a decision, an interview, a phone screen, an in-person because nothing happens until you have a conversation who can help make a decision and drive the process forward, right? So everything that you want to be working towards should be leading towards an interview. Everything else, resume, applying, even networking, that's all considered marketing. So I wanna share with you the one marketing technique that the professionals use in the industry to get people jobs. It's called an MPC, or Most Placeable Candidate. It is essentially a marketing sizzle about a particular candidate, right? A short summary or elevator pitch that you can draft for yourself. And I want to share with you a basic construct of how to make this for yourself. So one of the cardinal rules of cold calling is if I don't know you, I don't owe you. If I don't know who you are, I do not owe you my attention. So knowing that, I go straight for that objection. I say, who are you? My name is Julian Placino. I'm a so-and-so with X years of experience. The next thing that you want to do is provide an ROI statement. This forces you to think about your actual value. It's important to try to use numbers and statistics, percentages and dollar signs, right? Then you want to draw the relevance between, yes, these are great, but why is it relevant to my business? And then lastly, you create a very specific call to action. 
And look at the way this is worded. I'd like to schedule a meeting to see how it can help you achieve your business goals. Nothing about me. It's all about the employer, right? One of the things that I say to my job seekers who I coach is, the second that you start seeing yourself more of a problem solver and not a job seeker, the better off you're going to be. Are you available on X date, specific date? Then you follow up and say, I know things get busy, so if I don't hear from you before then, I'll follow up with you on X date. Already planting the bug, letting them know that you're gonna follow them. I'll send this over to Christina and she can send all this out to everyone here. Is that cool? So what does this look like all together? My name is Julian Placido. I'm a senior recruiter with 12 years of IT recruitment experience. In my last role, I saved over $1 million in search fees for Bottle Rocket, one of the premier mobile development firms in the world. I believe my IT recruitment experience combined with deep, my deep network of top IT candidates would be valuable to Alchemy, the company that I'm trying to apply for, right? And then you, you close with a call to action. Does that make sense? Yes. It forces you to think about your value, and you can re regurgitate that when you're in person with someone, or, which I'm gonna show you, is through, through messaging, right? So what actually is the 30 day to hire roadmap? When you look at recruiting, it really is a numbers game. There's so, there these kind of like number voodoo is what I've some people talk about, right? 27, three and one. If I'm recruiting for a position, I'm gonna line up 20 candidates. I'll probably connect with seven. I might interview three and then hire one. This process kind of reverses that, right? So what I'd like you to do, if you're starting a search for brand new, whether they have openings or not, because again, this is about finding the best job, your dream job. I want you to list 20 companies that you want to work for. And in those 20 companies, I want you to find no less than three stakeholders who can make a decision to hire you. And then you send in your NPC. That's kind of it. <laughs> right? But that 20 is always, you can always keep filling that and you start doing this process over and over and over again. I know this is overly simplistic, but I promise you this works. And I'll leave the rest with you. You've both been doing consulting work. Uh, you've both been involved with IT, you with IT staffing, you with other IT initiatives. Um, and it seems as though the, the common threads that I heard were getting intentional about understanding your value and then really broadcasting it. Is that, would that be fair? Yeah. You know, showing it on your, on your LinkedIn, really becoming memorable and, and something different from the crowd. And then with the MPC, you know, really showing one's value and, and just continuous follow-up. Um, let's talk, and, and thank you again for, for sharing some best practices in both of your perspectives. How can a standout candidate really set themselves apart with just a few moments in front of a recruiter? What, what is your ROI statement? Have you saved the company money? Have you streamlined processes? Because you, if you can tie the results that you've created in any job to increasing revenue, decreasing costs, and saving time, people will listen. We have created positions for people with this particular skill set. So I think it's that. The ROI, what you've done in previous companies, and then drawing relevance between that and the needs of this particular company. If you're not clear in your own mind, what it is you can do and the value you can bring, trust me, the recruiter's not gonna figure that out, nor is the company that's hiring them. You also have to realize, too, when a company agrees to interview you, they have looked at your background, maybe they've had help from HR or recruiter or referral, right, so you've already got your foot in the door. Be confident about that. Realize that they don't just feel like interviewing people for the heck of it. They are trying to fill a role what they're really trying to ascertain is, is this person the kind of person that will fit in our culture? Can this person, given their great experience and results they've achieved elsewhere, be able to do that again in this company? And so you need to, I think, be confident uh, in your ability to talk about what you've done, but you also need to help that company understand, I've done that, and I can do that again for you, and I'm excited about where you guys are taking the company. So, so it seems like a big part of the recruiter's job is to be a good matchmaker with the talent, potential talent, and the client. Um, 
in, in keeping with uh, thinking about business navigators are, as I mentioned before, we're founded on servant leadership. Many other companies have their own core values and their own company culture that they really try to hire for. How do you really get to the nut of finding maybe the what lies below the surface that's not so obvious to ensure that it is going to be a good, worthy match? I think all recruiters uh, have some sense of culture fit, right? If they know their client well, or if they're living with their client, as you were as a corporate recruiter, right? You know the culture. So you're listening and sensing for that. Uh, as a recruiter, you tend to get smart at what questions you need to ask to really understand, did this person do a good job because the company was doing well and they just happened to be there when good things happened? Or was this the person that was helped driving and leading that change? And so, you know, be prepared for, for recruiters to ask questions. Uh, what they're really probing for is, what did this person do? What results did they achieve? What did they learn? Can they do that again? And are they up for the challenge of whatever it is this, this company's uh, trying to go after? So I think the easier, uh, the more honest you are with a recruiter about what you can do or with someone you're networking with, okay, the easier it'll be for them to make that match and say, this opportunity is for you. Or, you know what, now that I know enough about you, a little bit more below the surface, this is not the right opportunity. I'm going to save you some time by not sending you down the wrong path at something that's ultimately not going to bring out the passion and be the right next step in your career. So don't be afraid to, to share some of that with the recruiter and, and ask them, what are they really looking for? What's it really like to work there? Where are they really headed with this role? What's their appetite for success? Because I'm going to play on that team. i got to understand where is that team going right? and see if I'm the right person to be part of that journey. And it's advantageous to work with more than one recruiter simultaneously, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so people always ask me, maybe, maybe you get this too. Oh, you're in recruiting? Here's my resume. Find me a job. <laughs> <laughs> and I always laugh because that's not the kind of recruiting I do. I meet wonderful people every day. But until a client says to me, I need somebody who's done X and Y and is available to do this and is interested in that or whatever. They give me this target. I do not bring them random candidates. I bring them someone who's an exact fit. So a lot of folks will, will contact me and say, Rich, I contacted you and you, uh, you told me you'd keep me in mind. It's been two weeks. What jobs do you have for me? <laughs> and I have to tell them, look, Corn Ferry is a great company. We don't win every search that's out there. Uh, so if I haven't called you back, it's because I don't have something that's worth your time. Uh, just realize I represent the client. I'm a talent scout. I'm not a talent agent. I think for me, early on in my career, one of my biggest mistakes was just kind of winging an interview with a candidate instead of being very intentional about the, the information that I was trying to tease out. Because I, have to like this great fun conversation. I had a friend at the end, but I didn't know anything about the candidate, right? But what I discovered is that there's actually seven variables that need to be in alignment in order to find the right match between employer and also candidate, and it forms the acronym M SLOMAC, which stands for motivation, skills, location, opportunity, money, availability, and culture. And when you have all of all of those uh, elements in alignment, you technically have the right match. So for me, it's a very systematic process um, of finding who this person is. Because in the world of recruiting, a lot of times you're not just working in a silo, you're trying to sell this candidate to other parties. Here, it gives me a data set, a set of data that I can present objectively why this candidate's the right match. Um, questions for you both. Uh, podcast you're listening to right now that you're loving or a book that you're reading right now? Julian? Uh, Masters of Scale uh, by Reed Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. What was that, the book or uh, podcast? podcast? Yeah. Right. Very good. Book. Michelle Obama's Becoming. Very nice. Uh, life advice that you love to give out to other people. Don't be afraid to work hard. When you're in the right role, when you're in a company that's the right fit for you, uh, you know, I, I tell especially folks who are new to the workforce, be there early. Work late. Don't be afraid to throw yourself into, into your work. 
nine to five is kind of a kind of a joke. If you want to move up in your career, you really have to embrace things. You really have to study your industry, your suppliers, your vendors, your customers, your product, your service, whatever it is your company company does, and whatever your role is in making that happen. And don't be afraid to pour your heart into it. Most CEOs that I've placed sleep four to five hours a night. They take time out for fitness. They are up very early and are in the office before others. They're not afraid to work late. Uh, they are also extremely well read and they invest a lot of time. I read a statistic somewhere, the average CEO reads about 55 books per year. So think about that. Someone who's been very successful in their career still has more to learn. So if you are not yet at that level, we've, we all have even more to learn. And don't be afraid to just, just bring it on and get immersed in your industry and be really passionate about what you do. The success will follow and you'll outpace your peers very quickly when you put in that kind of hard work. Don't be afraid to work hard. We're solidified. Julian, how about you? What's some favorite advice you like to dispense? Man, if there was one message that I could shout from the rooftops and communicate to every single human being out there, it's do the hard work of self-awareness. Get to know the things that you're good at. Get to know the things that you're bad at. Get to know the things that you like and you don't like. What are the activities that give you energy? What are the activities that drain your energy? Because once you find this intersection of your natural strengths, your areas of interest, and value creation for other people, whenever you find whatever that is for you, your life will never be the same. Are you passionate about that? I'm very passionate about that. <laughs> because I've been so lost for so long. I've been trying to achieve success how other people did it. You know, and learning from others is great. I value that. But only whenever I looked inside and became very intentional about finding out whatever it was that I was good at and pursuing things that I enjoyed and creating value for other people, then I was able to create my own lane, which no one else could duplicate. And the same thing exists for everyone in this room. Absolutely. And a lot of people in this room, I know from past experience with our typical subscriber base and those that come to business navigators events and even emerging leaders events, there's a lot of entrepreneurial people here in the audience. Um, and so finding a, finding a niche to where it is a perfect uh, alignment of personal core values, talents, gifts, strengths, and identifying uh, the energy index of you know, what, where we find energy and where it drains us. Um, identifying that, being able to find uh, what we can really bring to the world is, is a huge value. Because when you find that, you find more than just work. You find like a meaning and a purpose, you know what I mean? It's like everything starts to have meaning whenever you find that intersection. Totally. Uh, and finally, what's something that you're looking forward to for the rest of the year? So I was actually cast to be in an Amazon Prime documentary about entrepreneurship. We're shooting a project in uh, Canada here in the next couple weeks, and I'm looking forward to that. That's awesome. When can we watch that? Uh, summer 2020. Yeah. Nice. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes. All right. Rich? No pressure, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a daughter who is uh, going to be a senior in high school. I'm looking forward to helping, to s helping her figure out where does she want to go uh, since so she's so early on in her career uh, and helping her, watching her make those decisions. It's, uh, it's really exciting. Knowing what I know about executives and what decisions they made early on, it's been interesting to watch and see. Does she go through the right gates uh, to set herself up for success to find something that she's passionate in, that's, that's true to her skill set, uh, and I'm look, just looking forward to watching it blossom. Fantastic. Have you read the book, Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters? No, I haven't. Check it out, man. It's next on my list. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Don't want to give you more work, but I know you're not afraid of hard work. So there you go. Yeah. So, well, with that, thank you all so much for this conversation, um, and thank you very much for coming here.